I'm Heather Larkin. I live in Atlanta, and uh, I do macro photos. So what I'm going to teach you is we're going to talk about how to choose a macro lens that's best for you. So we're going to actually uh, talk a little bit about that. I have been a photographer for oh, this is 17 years, but it's 18 now. And you can find my regular job at Fairyography. I do portraits of little girls. But in my off time, I do macro photos of bugs or dewdrops or whatever. So we're going to talk about macro photography lenses today. So macro is the art of making the small bigger. It's taking little things and making big pictures out of them. By definition, a macro photograph is one where the subject is recorded on the negative or image sensor at a one to one ratio, which means life size. Every macro lens will give you one to one ratio, which is life size or better. If it's a one to three, that is one third of life size. Life size is reproduced on the film or image sensor at that size. This doesn't necessarily mean that every single image that you take is macro if you're using a macro lens. That also doesn't mean that you need to get right up on your subject every single image that you take or as far back away as you possibly can every single image that you take. So what I use in my particular world is the Sigma 50 millimeter 2.8 macro. It's discontinued. I bought that lens 20 years ago when I first started. And it served me so well that I actually switched camera bodies and repurchased it. I switched camera bodies again and bought it a third time. And switched camera bodies again and bought it a fourth time. The fourth time was for Sony. And I could not. Uh, make the Sony work with that lens because the, uh, the adapters were not quite working as well as they possibly could. Um, so to circumvent that, I ended up buying the 70 millimeter Art 2.8 because I thought, okay, it's as close as I can get right now to the 50 that I loved four times over. That said, I also use the 105 macro from Sigma. I like it a lot. It is very forgiving. It is very easy to use. And I don't have to be right up on my subjects, which is really important for macro. If you're chasing around bugs, ants, whatever, if you're chasing lizards, you scare them away if you're right on top of them. So that means that if you want to use something further away, you can use the Sigma 150. Now, this is also discontinued. I bought mine on eBay. It do what it do. Uh, the, the adapter doesn't quite, it's, it's not as fast as it could be. And so if you're really serious about macro, the other two lenses are a little bit better. I also use the 150 to 600 DGD in sports, which is not a macro lens, but it works well in a pinch. It will do. The wonderful thing about that lens is that because it is a telephoto, you can shoot at 150 on macro, but you can also zoom it out and get you know, hummingbirds in the trees over there, the same lens. It's also a great flower picture lens, which means that you can take it to 600, take a picture of a tulip, get it all separated from its, um, its background. It's a great dual purpose lens. So when choosing a macro lens, what you're looking at is depth of field. Now you can see with this nail, the depth of field on a macro lens is skinny winny and the snail's eyes are in focus. The rest of its shell is not. Now this doesn't pester me. It may pester you. That's okay. If you want the entirety of your subject in focus, you need more depth of field. So what does that mean? So depth of field is contingent on how close you are to your subject physically. The closer you get to your subject, the smaller of an area, front 
to back, as in close to you and further away, is what's in focus. So if you get closer physically, that means you have less of depth of field that's in focus. So you can see this frog. I was really close to his face. So that means his face is in focus. His butt is not. His arm is not. That is the way macro lenses work. So because a macro lens can get really, really close, that means this depth of focus, depth of field rather, is really, really tiny. And I'm talking millimeters here, really tiny. Adding extension tubes or close-up filters make this area even smaller. So if you've got a macro lens with an extension tube on the back of it and a close-up filter on the front of it, I'm talking like you might as well be like right on top of it and it's tiny and you're, you're gonna struggle if you don't have you know, a tripod or something like that. So a little bit of a graphic here. The closer you get to your subject, the smaller the depth of field is. Now, what does that mean for macro lenses? You can get the same picture close up or further away depending on the focal length of your lens. So you can see this ladybug, it's the same shot. It's the same picture. The only thing that's different between these two lenses is literally how close to the subject that lens is physically. So a 60 millimeter lens will allow you to get closer or conversely will force you to get closer to your subject. Now some of these things, this is an advantage. Some of the things that you're photographing, this is not an advantage. If you're taking pictures of jewelry or things that will not run away, that 60 millimeter is fabulous. If you're taking pictures of lizards or dragonflies, they're gone by the time you get close enough. And that's not fabulous. So, depth of field means with these really tiny, tiny depth of field, your own breathing can throw it out of focus. Uh, I don't use a tripod because I hate them. Uh, they scare the bugs and they take too long to set up and I can't get the heads right and I just lose my mind and whatever it was that I'm shooting is already gone anyway and I just wanna throw it out the window. So I don't use a tripod, I just hold my breath and overshoot. That's me, that's how I roll. If I was in the studio, it would be a different story. That's just the way I shoot. How you shoot and what you shoot may be completely different and a tripod may work well for you. So, however, a tripod is really nice for things that are not gonna run away. So if you're shooting ice outside in the morning when it's really dark and before the sun is up because you need to make sure that ice is not melting, that's great, that's perfect. <laughs> the frost is not gonna run away. Uh, adding a flash adds light, which means that you can use a higher aperture to give you more in focus area. Again, back to front, more in focus area so you can turn your aperture up and have more that you see. So you can see this image, this is one of my frost pictures before tripod and you can see that this image is actually not that well focused because I wiggled. So I use this in, in a, because I want you to show, I want you to see what not to do. <laughs> All right, so my settings, in general, aperture depends on what you wanna be in focus, shutter speed depends on how much light you have, and added light via flash will give you a higher shutter speed and consequently a higher aperture that you can use. I personally cannot shoot less than 1 250 because I wiggle. Honestly, I need to change that to 1320 one, because I just wiggle too much. Can't do it. Okay, so let's look at what aperture does to your photo. You can see over here on the left, I've got f4.5. Over here on the right, it's f11. So I personally prefer 
the 4.5 version because the F11 version is too busy. There's too much to look at in this shot. I don't necessarily need all of the rest of that story back there. However, the other one, conversely here, F9 is my favorite version from this pair because I want to see that story. I want to see that whole flower. I want to know what's going on back there. All of the fairy lights in the background aren't there in the other one. And I like those. So depending on the story that you want to tell influences your lens choice. So this leads to lens choices. Again, here's what I use. We're going to roll right back to that, and I'm going to show you some examples of each of them. So this is the 50 millimeter discontinued macro, and you can see that all of these, you know, they're, they're macro images. This is the 70 millimeter macro, and honestly, they look just like those. I would not be like, okay, well, this is obviously a 70 and this is obviously a 50 because they look really similar. That's the whole point of macro. It's supposed to. It's one-to-one -one ratio. You're supposed to be looking at life size or better. This is the 105 millimeter. And the 150. And that telephoto that kind of does macro really well. So what the difference is in all of these lenses is how close you are physically to your subject. So I set up this, this little thing in my kitchen. My, um, my subject is actually this ring right here. And you can see how tiny it is. I have very little fingers. This is very, very tiny ring. You're welcome to stop by the Sigma booth and see the ring in person if you want to. I have it on my finger now. So the same distance away experiment. I set up the 150 macro because it is the furthest away and took a picture of the same exact subject at the same distance away from the camera. I did not change the camera. So now what this means is that the 150 is close. The 105 is actually further back from its working distance. The 70 is even further back from its working distance. And the 50 is really far away. So what does that give us? Oh my gosh, this. So the 150 is one to one ratio. The 105, because I am backed too far away, it's further away from a subject. The 70, the same thing. The 50, the same thing. Now, this is a stupid experiment because nobody uses a macro image, a macro lens like this. If you're going to shoot a macro lens, you're going to be using it usually as close as you possibly can, not hanging out here in the back like the 50 millimeter lens. <laughs> like Nobody uses a macro image like that. So what happens? when we go to working distance. So this is how close your camera lens has to be from the subject in order to get one-to-one -one life size ratio. You can see that the 150 is a good oh, six or eight inches from the front of the lens. 105 is a little bit closer. The 70 is pretty darn close, and the 50 is pretty much right on top of it. Now, we can expect that if we're shooting a macro lens at one-to-one -one ratio, that if we're within one-to-one -one ratio distance, all of the resulting pictures will be identical. Is that right? That, it, whoop, that is right. So this is literally every single macro lens right at working distance. So again, the only difference between the macro lens is how close you have to get to your subject. If you're shooting things that do not run away, you can use a 50. It's great. 
if you're shooting things that do run away, that 50 is going to terrify that lizard, and the lizard is going to be gone, and you're going to be without a lizard picture. So here are a couple of images with the lenses that I use to shoot them. The 50 millimeter is lovely. Actually, I'm going to back it up, and I'm going to say a caveat here. The 50 millimeter has a problem, and that is, you can actually see it in this image, you are in your own light. You are so, literally, so close to your subject that you can sometimes cast a shadow, and you can see it right there going sideways. So that is a caveat to that lens. You have to light it from the side. So my preference for lenses is not the 50. So this is um, the second camera body that I bought this lens for, the Nikon D700. And I was probably about two inches from this Monarch Caterpillar. And it's not running away very fast, so it's fine. I didn't have to worry about that. They also can't see really well, so they don't care. <laughs> I'm like, you know, you're in my face with this thing, whatever. Also, vines, not running away. At least, maybe not very fast. So the 50 millimeter worked really well for this because it was an immobile subject. Now, when I, I do love this lens, I still own this lens, actually, and uh, when I now use it, I struggle a lot because you literally have to be, like, you've got the camera and you're like, really, it's like this close. And so you are, your head is terrifying. It, the camera lens looks like a big old giant eyeball hanging out. So if you're taking pictures of postage stamps, great, they're not afraid of you. If you're taking pictures of bugs or dragonflies or lizards that are going to run away, yes, absolutely, they will be terrified. The 70 millimeter allows you to get a little bit further away and put some distance between you and your subject. This also means that you can use an extension tube or a close-up filter a little easier because you're not going to have to be literally on top of your subject. So this is a, the beard of a bearded iris in the fog. So we had a whole bunch of dew and fog that morning. And so I was able to get really, really super close to this because the flowers are also not running away. This is also the 70. This is dewdrops in fennel. The dewdrops are not being scared of you. It doesn't matter how far away you are. You can have yourself and uh, like sit down and, and hang out, and that's exactly what I did. However, this is the 105. Now, this bee was asleep in this flower. He was cold. He was not running away. However. He did see me, and I did freak him out because I was close with the 70. So I switched to the 105 and stepped back because the 70 was scaring him. He wasn't warm enough to fly yet. He was still kind of freaked out, and he would raise his leg and be like, no, nah, no pictures, please. <laughs> And so all of the 70 millimeter macro images that I got with this guy, he's like, give me a high five. Hey, hey. And I was like, I really don't need 20 bazillion pictures of this bee. And he's like, hey. Um, so I switched to the 105, backed up a little bit, and it didn't scare him as much, so I was able to get him with his feet down. Now, I don't know if any of you have played with these guys, these long-legged flies. The minute your, your shadow, like if you cast a shadow on them, they're gone, completely gone. Uh, if they think that you are a predator, they're toast. Uh, they just, they're very flighty, they're very skittish, and these are a challenge, they're very difficult. So, the 70 millimeter scares them away, the 105 does not, because I don't have to be right on top of them. 150 means that I can get really, really close to these dewdrops. Obviously, I don't have to worry about scaring them away. However, 
Um, the disadvantage of a closer lens for dewdrops is, is that you might hit the grass with the front of the lens, or if you have the lens hood on, you'll do it, and uh, knock all the dewdrops off of the off of the thing and ruin your shot. 150, 105, you don't have that problem because you can back up. This is a magnolia jumping spider. They have amazing eyesight and they can see you coming. Now, green on green on green on green, they're hard to find. Not only like if you to see them to begin with, but if you scare them and they run away, you'll never see it again. They're impossible to keep track of. So the 150 works really well because you don't have to be right on top of her. You don't have to scare her away. And you can back up. So that's the end of my show. Does anybody have any questions real fast before I run away? <laughs> ah! <laughs> Time to dive off the stage. It'd be good? Yes, sir. What kind of f stops? What kind of f stops was I using? That's a good question. So normally I shoot at around 4.5 to 5.6 because I personally prefer a lot of blur in the background and front to back focus doesn't really pester me that much. Yes, sir. Oh, that's a good question. All right, so the question was, if I'm using a 150 lens, aren't I concerned with the shake? The answer is yes, because I wiggle a lot. So I'm over here, and I'm crouched down to get this spider, and she's under a leaf, and I'm like <laughs> And it's, it's hard, it's really hard. Uh, I hold my breath, I firm up my thighs, and I shoot a bunch, and then oh. And then I go back and try it again. Um, if you have time to set up a tripod, that would be an advantage. But uh, for these girls, they um, don't like a whole lot going on. So I would just pick a shutter speed that works for keeping that minimized. Anybody else got any questions? Yes, sir. Do I use flash? The answer is yes, I do. Not all the time. Uh, this little girl was not. And um, I hate carrying it with me because it, like, I have a spider holster, so it rubs my thigh and makes a whole bunch of noise and drives me crazy. Um, but I do have one, and it does help. It's kind of the same question. Use a ring flash? A ring do I use a ring flash? No, I don't. Um, I actually have, it's a, uh, in my hot shoe, and it points down. It has a diffuser that like points down because if you use a hot shoe without a diffuser, the flash will actually go over your subject and not down at. So the diffuser that I use is built to like pull it down. No? I thought I saw a raised hand. Anybody else? I think I'm out of time. Yep. Thank you so much.